Amen. What is that joy and honor to be here? Let me tell you what, that's good singing, brother. Good singing. I'm going to be honest with you, I know you ain't supposed to be jealous, but I'm a little jealous of that voice. And that beard, too, man. It took me 41 years to grow what I got. How old are you, brother? 25 years old. I remember them good days, good old days back then. But I like to say it is an honor to be here. Honestly, um, this is probably a highlight of my ministry. One of the highlights of my ministry. Uh, the Lord, every once in a while, lets you preach for, for, for preachers and men that you highly look up to. And uh, this is uh, something I prayed for for a long time. And I'm thankful the Lord opened the door to allow me to preach here. I have the utmost respect for your pastor. Uh, he's a Bible student. And I'll tell you from the get-go, you're not going to get anything as deep from me that you get from him. I promise you that. Um, but we're going to just try to obey the Lord and just preach the Lord, put on a heart. And um, I want you to pray for me. I've been <clears throat> under the weather, been battling these sinuses, and uh, they've been really uh, getting me. So if you hear me cough some, I'm, I can't help it. I, I do apologize. But it, again, it is an honor to be here. I'm Heath Wells, and welcome back to church. My pastor is Robert Jarvis. And if you got your Bibles, I promise you I won't take. I, I promise you I will not keep you long. Uh, if you listen fast, I'll preach fast, and we'll get a hamburger or something like that. I like to eat, don't you? Um, but um, if you got your Bible and, you, and you're able to stand, you turn to Acts chapter 18 if you don't mind. Acts chapter 18. Just going to mind the Lord and just preach what the Lord put on my heart. And I hope that um, it can be an encouragement and blessing to you. <clears throat> Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> We begin reading in verse number one. <clears throat> I hear some plays still flipping. I'll wait on you. If you got your place, you just say amen, all right? Amen. amen. <clears throat> After these things, Paul departed from Athens and, Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And if you're going to testify, you ought to testify that Jesus was Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and when they opposed himself and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Where will we be without the ministry of the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, I mean, God gave him the ministry to the Gentiles, and through his ministry... We, we're standing here today because of his ministry, amen? Um, let me find my place. And he departed thence and entered into a, a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard into the synagogue. If you're going to hang around somebody, you better hang around somebody that worships God, amen? amen. We're going to hang around people, hang around people that know something about the Lord, amen? amen. And um, then the Bible says, And Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue, Believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Be not afraid but speak. And hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. No man shall sit on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months. Teaching the word of God among them. You may be seated. Father, I want to thank you for the good day. Lord, thank you for your many blessings of life and how good you are to us. Lord, I ask you now just for a few minutes, Lord, you help overcome the infirmities of my flesh. <clears throat> Lord, I pray you, you touch me. <clears throat> Lord, I pray you saturate my mind and liberate my lips. Lord, I know it's not in my delivery, Lord, I didn't, it's whether I preach loud, whether I preach soft. Lord, the power lies in your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us at night, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. At 8.17, on the evening of March 3rd, 1943, 
Bomb sirens rang through the air above London, England. Workers and shoppers stopped on sidewalks and boulevards, and they began to search the air. Buses came to a halt, and their passengers emptied out. Driver after driver began to slam on brakes, and they began to step out of their cars. It said gunfire could be heard in the distance, and nearby anti-aircraft artillery forces launched a barrage of rockets. It said that crowds on the street began to scream. Some people threw themselves on the ground. Others covered their head and shouted, they are starting to drop bombs on us. Everyone looked above for the enemy planes, but the fact that they saw none did nothing to damper their hysteria. People raced toward the Bethel Green Underground Station to take refuge, where more than 500 citizens had already taken refuge. In the next 10 minutes, it said, 1,500 more people would join them. It said that trouble began when a rush of safety seekers seeked, rush of safety, reached the stairway entrance at the same time. It says a woman carrying a baby lost her footing on the 19 uneven steps leading down from the street. It said that her stumble interrupted the oncoming flow causing a domino effect of others to tumble on top of her. Within minutes, they say, within minutes and within seconds, hundreds of horrified people were thrown together, piling up like laundry in a basket. To make matters worse, to make matters worse when the late arrivals thought that they were being deliberately blocked from getting in the underground tunnel, which they were not, they began to push as hard as they could. They say the chaos lasted for less than 30 minutes. They say the scene was horrific. It said that the detangling of the bodies took until midnight. In the end, 173 men, women, and children died. What they thought was enemy attacks turned out to be a new secret anti-aircraft rocket battery being tested, test-fired in Victoria Park nearby for the first time. Nobody knew it was there, and nobody had heard the fire before. So they, when the investigation was over, they come to this conclusion, and the conclusion was this. No bombs had been dropped. No bomb had killed anybody. What killed the people was fear. Was fear. We're thrown into the mix of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey. And if you read the books of Acts, and uh, you'll see how, how God is beginning to bless his ministry and God is using him to reach people and to start churches. This man has, he has been through a lot in his short time. You know that from scripture. He has been, he has been for one, and when he got saved in Acts chapter 9, they began to try to slay him. They began to try to kill him, but it wasn't his time. You come to Acts chapter 16, and they imprison him. They put him behind bars. They try to shut him up to stop him from preaching the gospel, but that ain't stopping. There's a lot of opposition when it comes to his ministry that he's been through. Listen to me now, if you understand something for a minute. They sought to kill him. They've already stoned him, and he's left dead in Lystra. He had already been beaten with rods and imprisoned in Philippi. He had already been threatened to run out of Thessalonica. I mean, this is a man, listen to me for just a minute. This is a man that's not, not used to, um, he's, he, he's comfortable. He knows what opposition is. He under, he sees it, he's been through it. And God, when he gets to Acts chapter 18, God begins to bless his ministry again. 
you'll find it. God is so blessed, and you'll find that the Bible says, listen to me, the Bible says that, that in Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue, I'm talking about the head honcho, man. I'm talking about the cream of the crop. I'm talking about the Austin Wagners of the Patrick. I'm talking about the main man. Has then got saved. And the Bible says that many has believed and were baptized. And opposition is starting to mount. I want you to understand something. Get this. When God uses you to, to achieve great things for him, rest assured there will be great attacks from Satan. Rest assured. Satan is not worried about you if you're lazy if you're complacent, if you really don't have no desire to walk with the Lord. But let me tell you something. When you get active in your worship, let me say, when you get involved in your walk, you get involved in the work and the witnessing for Jesus, you know now you have now put a big target on your back for the fiery darts of the wicked one. It's been said, listen to me now, it's been said, where God gives great opportunity to minister, there will be great opposition to the ministry. I want to say something. God has given Resurrection Baptist Church a great opportunity to minister here in this town. And when you get involved in worshiping, working and witnessing, rest assured, Satan is not going to take that laying down. He's going to do everything he can to try to stop you and hinder you from doing what God has called you to do. And one of the, the tactics that he used, listen to me now, Satan knows he can never Stop the church. For Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Satan will never stop it. But you find, even though he can't stop it, he'll do everything in his power to scare it. Because he knows if he can scare you, he can hinder you and hurt you from doing what God has called you to do. You'll find that God is blessing his ministry. God is using him. And I can't help but believe that we've all been there. You know what I'm saying? We can ridicule Paul, but God told him, he come to him in the middle of the night, and he said this, then the angel of the Lord uh, the spake to the, uh, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Those words, if you really study them out, carries the implication that whatever was going on, the opposition that was mounting, had brought Paul to a standstill where he would not preach, he would not teach, he would not stand up and do what God had called him to do. Fear would do that to you. Matter of fact, the book of uh, Psalms says this, that fear brings a snare. Anybody ever done some hunting, done anything like that? You, bring, you, you put a snare out, what snare do you, it's supposed to catch the animal. When it catches him, it binds him. He can't move. He can't go forward. He's stuck. He's enclosed. And fear, when fear grips your heart, it bounds you. It, it, it makes you where you can't go on for God. It, it, it encompasses you. It, it, it just bounds you up. You ever been there? I sure have been. And listen, we can ridicule Paul for getting scared. But how many times has God told you to witness somebody at the grocery store? Come on now. Anybody with me? How many times has God told you and I, hey, give that, give that man a gospel track, but you let fear stop you? How many times have we been out in the schoolhouse and God said, witness to one of your classmates, but you let, 
You let, you let, you let fear because you, you didn't want them to ridicule you. You didn't want them to talk about you. You didn't want them to think you was different than them. And you let fear stop you from doing what God has called you to do. We've all been there. I know I have more than once. But let me tell you something. Listen, God's will does not change according to our circumstances or our situation. God's will is still for us to stand up, speak up, and give people the gospel. Y'all with me? So he's in this place. Listen, he's in this place where where he's fearful. He's scared. And I want to say this. I can't help but think and believe that fear has killed more Christian potential and more church's power than COVID ever had. Than Congress ever will. Fear. There's men that I thought would never back up, would always hold the line, but they've taken a step back out of fear of what might happen to them. That ain't the way God intended it. God intended us to stand up, speak up, and do what's right in the day and hour we live in. Because God has saved us for what? Such a time, such a time as this. And if we don't do it, who will? So he's in this this place of uncertainty. He's scared. And God comes through. In the midnight of his life, he comes through and he gives him a word. I'm thankful that when you're going through the times in your life, the hard times in your life, the uncertain times in your life, the fearful times in your life, God has given us a word, friend. God has given us a word that we can look into and we can read. And you know what God was doing? You know what God was doing in this situation here? Paul was stuck. He wouldn't go forward. God wanted him to continue on there in Corinth, but he was, he was stuck. He wasn't going to do it. And, Paul, and God came through in the middle of the night and spoke to him. He said, be not afraid, but speak, for I'm, I am with thee. No man will sit on thee to hurt thee, and I have much people in this city. You know what God was doing in in this situation? He was giving Paul a little courage to continue. There's going to be times in your life, there's going to be times in my life, where you're just going to need a little courage to continue. Listen, there's no doubt in my mind there's some boys and girls in here who grew over the summer. You was faithful to the church. You got a little bit, you got closer to the Lord. But now you've gone back with a rubber meets the road where people ain't like you. People not going to uh, uh, be friendly to you because you're a Christian. No, they're going to ridicule you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to they're gonna push you into suicide and say they have nothing to do with you. And you're going to feel in your heart, listen, uh, it's, you're going to be scared, but God still wants you to be faithful to do what he called you to do, and that is to be a witness. In that dark place. So he gives Paul a little courage to continue. Maybe you're here tonight and you know in your heart that God has called you to do something. But deep down inside, you've let fear keep pushing it off. You keep pushing it off. And you won't do it. Well, God sent me here tonight to tell you there's a little courage for you to continue on and do what I've called you to do. I'm going to give you three things, and we're going to go, okay? We're going to go. Listen to what he said. I want you to notice this. He tells him, why should we continue on? He gave him a little courage to continue. The first thing I want you to notice this. First thing I want you to notice is this. There's a charge to continue. A charge to continue. You say, where do you see that at? See it in verse number 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Listen to what he said. Be not afraid. It's a charge. 
God didn't come to Paul and say, you know what, Paul, if you're scared, if you want to stay there, that's perfectly fine with me. You just make up your mind. I'm okay with it. You just, you know, if you want to leave, that's fine too. No, what God told him, he came to him in the middle of the night, and this is the word he said to him. Be not afraid. That was a command. That was a charge. To not be afraid. God don't want us to be scared. The opposition we're facing, the situation we're facing, listen, we're, we're just flesh and bone, but at the end of the day, God said, don't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid. Anybody with me? Isaiah 44 said, he says this, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Deuteronomy 36, 31, 6. Be strong and a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. Joshua 1, Joshua 1 9. For, for have not I commanded thee? Be strong and a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. They tell me if you, you study it out, there's 365 verses in your King James Bible. They start with the words, fear not. That's one verse for every day of the year. And whatever you're facing tomorrow, whatever you're going to face for uh, a, a month from now, two months from now, rest assured there's a verse in that Bible that says, fear not. There's a charge to continue. A charge to continue. <laughs> and I know some of y'all know who John Wayne is. He said this, John Wayne said, courage is not being scared. Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Courage is being scared to death, but getting in the saddle anyway. I, I was home one day, and I was um, watching, uh, well, I don't get to watch TV much. If my, if my kids are home, the, it, it's, it's on cartoons. And, and, um, I even find myself sometimes when, when, they not, when they're gone, I get to watch TV and I find myself watching cartoons. Anybody been there? <laughs> well, my kid, my wife, kids are going to go shopping. You know, they're going to they're gonna go buy some nice stuff, nice stuff, and I'm walking around with holes in my socks. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what we fathers do, right? Right. So I'm sitting at home and, I, and I, I was just flipping through TV and I came across the History Channel and I was talking to this soldier. He was in the Afghan war and they was talking to him and he began to talk about a, a situation that they faced um, him and some of his men and um, they, they need to occupy this, this one area but the, the opposition was starting to mount against them and if they didn't get to this one area and begin to occupy it, all of them was probably going to lose their life so the commander of the group said listen we're going to have to get out of there and occupy that because if we don't, we stay here, we're going to lose a life. Well, the, the gentleman said, okay. Well, he started looking, and nobody, nobody stood up to say, okay, I'll lead us out. Well, the gentleman said, you know what? I, I finally stood up and said, okay, follow me. And he said, they followed us, he, he followed us and we ended up at this one, this one place, and uh, we came safely, we, we occupied, and, and I'm here to tell you that we are alive today. And the reporter, I'll never forget what the reporter said. <clears throat> the reporter said this, because he said something about being scared. And the reporter said, well, how did you overcome your fear? He said, it was simple. He said, I had, a com I had an order from my commander. You know how you can overcome your fear? You know how you overcome what God wants you to do? You got to rest sure and know something. Did you have an order from your, your commander? Be not afraid. There's a charge, friend, to continue. Not only is there a charge to continue, why don't you notice this? There's comfort to continue. There's comfort. But what did he tell him? He said, Then spake the Lord of Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold thy peace. And here's the comfort right here. Here's the comfort. For I am with thee. Oh, you got to understand something. Oh, what great comfort that had to bring the Apostle Paul. 
What great comfort in his heart to know that God himself, I mean the creator of heaven and earth, I mean the one that created you and me, the one that holds everything in his hand, I mean the author and finisher of our faith, the one who saved us and died for us, said, Paul, I'm with you. What comfort that brought him. It's no matter what you face, no matter what you're going through, the devil, I promise you one thing, he'll make sure, listen, he'll make sure that you feel like you're all by yourself. He will. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's what he'll do. The word comfort means to, to give strength and hope and cheer, to ease the grief of trouble or console. Thank God. Jesus said, I must go away. I'm going to send the comforter unto you, right? And the day we got saved, that same comforter, the Bible says, now he dwells in us. No matter where I go, no matter where life takes me, God's going to be with me every step of the way. Even though at times I feel like I'm by myself, i got to live by the facts of the Bible. And the Bible says this, God is always with me. God is always with me. But you know what? I believe it's a learning lesson in Paul's life right here. See, there's some things you have to learn along this Christian journey. That's a lot of things I've learned since I've been saved that I didn't know when I first, I really didn't get a hold of when I first started. What do you mean? Well, I tell you this. Paul said this. He said, he said, I have learned that whatever state I am, there to be content. He said, I learned that. It wasn't something that he knew at the beginning. He said, I've learned it, right? He said, I've learned whatever state I am to be content. That's what he said. All right, what did he say when he, later on, when he's on trial? When he's on trial, and he said this. This is after this. He said this. He said, at first glance, no man stood with me. He said, there wasn't a man there standing with me, speaking up for me. But this is what he said. Nevertheless, God stood with me. I believe it's a learning lesson in Paul's life right here. God reminded him. God let him know, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, Paul, I'm with you. You can do it. Keep going. What comfort it ought to bring our heart that his presence is with us. I quoted some verses earlier, but I quote some more. Matthew 28, 19 through, uh, 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Deuteronomy 31, 6, quoted a while ago. Be strong, good courage. Fear not, not be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is thou that goeth with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Isaiah 41, 10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Amen. Amen. Brought him comfort. It's comfort to continue because we got his presence. It's comfort to continue because we got his, per we got his protection. We got his protection. What the Bible says, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. There'd be times, listen, if God wants to, to, to give the enemy the, uh, the, the ability to hurt us, to harm us, listen, the devil's got to get a work permit from the God. The book of Job clearly proves that. But when God said, listen to me, Paul, Paul's already been beaten, stoned, prison. Don't you think that probably brought Paul some comfort to know, listen, here in Corinth, not a, not a hair of my head will be harmed. I'm thankful that we have a God that protects us, don't you? Thank God he's our shield, he's our refuge. We don't need to worry. Listen to me. Listen, I might not be able to show up and help you, but I promise you one thing, God can protect you. Amen. Psalm 46, 6, 46 says this, God is our refuge and our strength, a very uh, a help, present help in our trouble. The Bible says this, if God be for us, who can be against us? Listen, 
You can do what God's called you to do. Young man, don't be scared of those at the schoolhouse. Young lady, don't be scared of those at the schoolhouse. Listen to me, sir. Don't be scared of those workers at work. God will protect you. God will make sure if you do what he called you to do, he'll make sure that everything works together for your good when it's all said and done. Right? His protection. Listen, there is comfort to continue because of his presence. His protection. Not only that, there's comfort to continue because of his people. His people. Listen to what the Bible says. He told him, he said, for, for I have many people in this city. I'd like to talk to your pastor and ask him what he thinks that means. We already know that a lot of people's already been saved. Is he telling Paul that a lot of more people's going to be saved here? Or is he telling Paul that there's some more believers here? Because Paul's already been in one of them's house that worship God. And I told you earlier, there'll be times in your life where you'll be somewhere trying to serve the Lord. And you're going on deputation, correct? You're going, I don't know where you're going, brother. Oregon. Listen, I'm going to, I'll probably rest assured and probably tell you this. It won't be long before you get out there. For the devil's going, going to have you thinking you're all by yourself. There's nobody, there's nobody out there that believes like you. There's nobody out there that's going to stand like you. But rest assured, God always has his people. God always has his people. He said, for I have much people in this city. And you know what I found sometimes? Listen, the devil will make you feel like you're all by yourself. I think about Elijah who called fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel. And he killed the prophets of Baal. And, and we know that uh, Jezebel got word of it and got word, hey, he's gonna, she's going to do the same thing to, he, to him that done to the prophet. He flees. He's under a Jupiter tree begging God to take his life. I'm paraphrasing all this. And the angel of the Lord came to him and touched him and said, Arise and eat. And again, it came to him and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for thee. And he, he ate and he went, a, he went on a little journey and he came to a cave. And the, uh, the, the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God knows everything. God knew what he was doing there. Let me tell you what I think God was trying. God was just trying to get him to talk to him. God wants you to talk to him. In other words, Elijah began to pour his heart out to him and said, look, Israel's broken the covenant, tore down the altars, and he said, I'm the only one, I'm paraphrasing on that, I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one left serving you. God told him to get up and go. I still got 7,000 men that ain't bowed the knee to Baal. He said, you know what God told him? You ain't by yourself. You ain't in this thing alone. Well, I still have my people. I have still people that are saved by God's grace and wants to live for me and serve me. And just maybe, just maybe, by you standing up with boldness in your heart and courage in your heart, doing what God calls you to do, it will begin to reveal those among you that believe like you. You say, what do you mean? You think Paul, he's writing to the, the believers at Philippi. He's giving them a report about how things are going with him. And he said, everything that's happened to me has, further, has went out to the furthest of the gospel. He said, the gospel's reached the palace in every place. What did he say after that? And the brethren have waxed bold in my bonds that they might speak the gospel more boldly. Tell you something. Listen to me, young man, young lady. If you'll stand up in the midst of ridicule, in the midst of people treating you unfairly, in the midst of fear, if you'll stand up with a boldness in your heart, knowing God's with you, God's going to protect you, you just might reveal there's others among you. It just needs somebody to give them a little courage to continue. His people, his people. Lastly, 
I'm done. I know y'all probably like, amen, amen. We see the charge to continue, be not afraid. We see the comfort to continue, he's got his presence, he's got his protection, he's got his peace. Lastly, we see the call to continue, the call. Why should I keep going? Why shouldn't I stop? Why shouldn't I back up? It's clear. Verse number 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among, here it is, here it is, them. Them. Why we can't back up, brother? Why we got to keep going? Why we can't let fear cripple us, hinder us, hurt us from doing what God called us to do? Because of them. Because of them. Them. God. Listen to me now. When God saved you, it wasn't for a temporary thing. Barry Rackett said, God never does anything for a temporary purpose. He always has an eternal purpose in mind. The Bible, my understanding says this, God sees the end from the beginning. He saved Paul knowing Paul would come to this very moment to this very moment, knowing there was people that needed to hear the gospel. Is there not a call to keep going? I mean, how wicked can this world be? I mean, we should be out in the streets, man, telling people about Jesus. Don't let fear stop us. Listen, the cause is this. Sinners need to be saved. Everywhere you go, I mean, people's lives are messed up. They're ruined. They're heading to hell. And if somebody don't give them the gospel, who will? The call to continue is that sinners that need to be saved. But listen to me now. That the call to continue because there's saints that need to be strengthened. Listen, there's some saints that's ready to give up. There's some saints that's ready to kick out. And they need somebody to come by that way and give them the word. Listen, if, if I had a, if I had a, if I had a, uh, uh, a verse, uh, uh, you know, preachers have a verse. If I had a verse, I think it's, I think it's Isaiah 50, 54, 1, I think it's what it is. But it says this, it says, as a matter of fact, I have been given the tongue of the learned that I might be able to speak a word to him in season who is weary. That would be my verse because I run into people all the time that's ready to quit that's ready to give in they've been beat up by the world the devil's done attacked them man they're ready to kick out man if i can just say something do something to encourage them to go another mile it's worth it man there's saints man that needs to be strengthened the call to continue is this there's, there's sinners that need to be saved. There's saints that need to be strengthened. And lastly, there's a Savior that needs to be satisfied. There's a Savior that needs to be satisfied. I think about this all the time. If I was to draw my last breath, what I've done to this, up to this point, would God be able to say, well done, Thou good and faithful servant. I'll hate to admit, probably not. Probably not. And when you take your last breath, that's the only thing that's going to matter. Whether you use your life to satisfy and bring glory to him. I'm going to give you this illustration I'm done. Anybody know about them jump parts? They call them, they call them jump parts, like big air. You know the place where you got to take a second mortgage out on your home so your kid can go jump for an hour? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, just expensive, man. Well, my, I took my son up there. He ain't been too long ago. He likes going up there. My daughter, she, she's 12. She, you know, she, she, she's a girly girl now, you know what I mean? She don't want to do none of that stuff. Took my son up there. They had this big old diving board, man. 
He's, he's planning on everything. He, 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 he told me. He said, I'm, I'm going to do that before we leave. I said, all right. I, all right. Well, he said, come on. It's time to go over there. So he got up on that thing. He got up on it. And he got there, and he, and he, and he took off. And he stopped at the end. He turned around and looked at me. And he went back. I said, all right. All right, buddy, you can do it. He took off running, stopped, turned around and looked at me. I was like, okay, third time's always the charm, right? You'll get it this time. So he, took off, he takes off running, and I said, he's going to do it. And he stopped. He almost fell off. He stopped. And people, the kids were starting to mount up, and uh, he, he, he kind of just looked at me. He looked back at me, looked at me, looked back, and he said, Hey, Daddy. I said, yes, son. He said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. So he gets down on his knees, and he crawls over to the, to the side, and it's about where I can see him, about right here. He said, Dad, I need to ask you a question. I said, shoot, son. We, we got we to hurry. His kids want to jump. And this is what he said. I'll never forget it. He said, Daddy, he said, do you believe in me? I said, yes, son. I believe in you. He said, Daddy, do you believe in me? I said, yes, son. I believe in you. He stood up, went back, and he took off, and he jumped. And every single time we go, he jumped off that thing 30 or 40 times. You say, what did he need in that moment that he was fearful? He just needed a little courage to continue. Listen to me, child of God. What God called you to do and what God wants you to do, he believed in you. He died upon the cross for you. He indwells you with his spirit. You are his workmanship. And I promise you, there is courage to continue. The charge, be not afraid. The comfort, he's with us. His protection, his people. The call. Saints need to be saved. I mean, uh, sinners need to be saved. Saints need to be strengthened. And there's a Savior to satisfy.